Hello and welcome to Northeast Ohio Media Group and the Plain Dealers live wine tasting show. We're here at Heinen's. I'm Denise Polverine. We're here with a panel of experts at the Pepper Pike Heinen's location. And for the next half hour, we're going to be tasting some wonderful wines. Making up our panel of experts tonight, beginning on the end, is Heinen's beer and wine buyer, Ed Tompkins. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you. In the middle, we have a plain dealer columnist for beer and wine, Mark Bona. And next to me, Northeast Ohio Media Group's restaurant and dining writer, Joe Crea. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to taste three wines tonight, and again, they're all available at your local Heinen's location. Hopefully, you are joining us at home, tasting right along with us. First, I'd like to ask you, Joe, to just kind of explain the concept here. You know, set it up for us. What are sure. we going to be doing tonight? You know, there's all kinds of mumbo jumbo and mystique about wine, and it gets tiresome real quickly, and it puts a lot of people off. I think it intimidates people, and it's unnecessary. Wine's a wonderful, fun world, and there's so much to enjoy and so much to know. And what we're here to do is to offer some perspective and opinions, but what we want to do is hear from you. What do you think? What are you tasting? Are you enjoying what we're, what we're tasting here? Do you think we're completely all wet, or is it kind of matching what you're thinking? So we want some feedback from you. That's right. And make sure that you post, you're watching the video right now, make sure you post in the comments below. We'll take all your questions and we'll give it to the panel. But Mark, try to dig in a little deeper here. What are the mechanics of a wine tasting? We know it's really a, a sensory experience. Well, my mantra has always been drink what you like, but to do that, you, it's really a good thing to be armed with a little bit of knowledge. So the real basics, three basic things to know in order, swirl, smell, and sip. Uh, when you swirl a wine, uh, you should have only a third of the glass should be filled, so you don't want to slosh it all over the place. You want to smell it. You're going to get notes out of that aroma that may or may not be there in the actual flavor when you taste it. When you finally sniff it, breathe it in, uh, or sip it, I should say, uh, you'll get different flavors on your palate. Your taste buds are, are in various places in your tongue and different sensory experiences, you'll get different flavors out of sipping it than you will out of, out of the aroma. And take some time to look at the wine. If you look up in light and see the wine, a, a slightly darker shade might indicate age. It could be a little older. Doesn't mean bad, it just means a little bit older. Red on the rim on the side, if it's a little brown, that could be an older red wine versus a younger one that has a more purplish tint. Okay, great. And then Ed, share with us how you selected these three wines. Well, the idea was to have nice summer whites and reds, and we can still do that in lieu of summer being here. Uh, these are wines that work well any time of the year, but uh, really geared towards summer entertaining, summer kind of dishes, lighter foods, lighter flavors, uh, great complimentary wines. Uh, heavy on the white, rosé, the ultimate summertime wine. Uh, rosé just tastes better in the summertime. And then a nice big brawny red that's excellent with grilled uh, foods, grilled meats, uh, nice spicy character. So it's all about not just the wines themselves, but kind of pairing them to summertime cuisine. All right, great. Well, as we're about to get underway here, um, we want to remind you again to post your questions in the comments section below. Again, any question that you have or if you're tasting along with us, we want to hear your feedback. We're going to share our thoughts with you, but we want to hear what you think as well. So let's begin with the Chardonnay, please. So as we pour the wine here, um, we have some people asking about food pairings, specifically with Chardonnay. Is it something that you should only, and we're, we're actually having some salmon tonight, is it something that traditionally goes with fish, and, and what other types of foods? Well, I would say drink what you like and drink what tastes good. Uh, it really is, and this, we're the panel of experts, so we should be the snobs, and that's really not the case. Uh, if you don't like Chardonnay, it doesn't matter how much we say this wine goes with the salmon, you're not going to like it. So you have to enjoy the wine first and foremost. Uh, but there are some rules, quote unquote, that do apply. You never ever want the wine to overwhelm the food. You're wasting your money if you do that. You're always looking for balance. You know, wine itself in the glass is all about balance. Balance of flavors, balance of uh, acid, balance of oak, balance of tannins. You want that balance then to translate the balance of flavors between the food and the wine. Okay, describe to us what you're doing. We see you swirling and sniffing and some other We're acting things. Acting like snobs. <laughs> <laughs> acting like snobs. But Tell see, that, but that's exactly it. I mean, people will say, well, you look like a snob and you're no. holding it up and you're checking your swirling, but you're just adding to the sensory experience. I mean, it just helps you learn more about the wine. There's a lot of different flavors here. I mean, right off the bat, I'm going to say, and this is fun because you can agree or disagree, there's not exactly a, a wrong or right answer, but I'll say I get some citrus and a little bit of melon out of it. Yep. Which indicates ripeness a lot of times. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, the way the wine smells or tastes 
a lot of times is due in part to the growing conditions, how hot it was, how cool it was. Uh, ripeness of the vintage, ripeness of the grapes translates into uh, riper fruit flavors and ar ar aromatics in the wine as it's resulting. All right. And then could you just tell us a little bit of what, what is a Chardonnay? What, what makes a really good Chardonnay? Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, balance, but Chardonnay is, is really, uh, I think, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong, Chardonnay is kind of is the only grape that has a bit of a controversy, and that is oaked versus unoaked. No other wine out there really is oaked, unoaked rosé, oaked rosé, unoaked Syrah, unoaked Syrah. So maybe that's a good kind of segue to explain what oak does to Chardonnay and why those flavors work sometimes and sometimes they don't. Oak come, the oak flavor comes about from primarily from the, the storage vessels, from the tanks. There could be stainless steel. You could store wine in stainless steel. You can, you can store it in a variety of different wooden barrels. It could be French, it could be American. Wood, all those, all those items basically yield different flavors. They, they lead to different flavors. When I taste the Chardonnay, I was like, and I, I think this would be neat to do, uh, just as there's obviously no right answer, no wrong answer, but I always think of from totally unoaked at zero to chewing on a wood board, on a cedar board or an oak board at, at 10, where would you put a wine? And it's just personal preference. I mm -hmm. like things a, sli a smidgen more oaky. I know my wife loves uh, unoaked Chardonnays. So there's plenty out there on both ends of the spectrum. Right. I'm going to say, I'll throw this out and say this is about a four in terms of oak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trying to preserve the, uh, the varietal and the appellation. This is from the Alexander Valley in Sonoma County, California. More thought of as a red wine growing climate. Uh, it's, a, so it's a warmer climate for Chardonnay, so you're going to get that ripeness like we spoke of right. earlier. Uh, but to Mark's point earlier, there is some oak there, but it doesn't taste like oak. You know, oak is like, I would say, oak to wine is like salt is to food. You don't want the food to taste salty, you don't really want the wine to taste oaky. It should be an adjunct to the flavors. And the lighter oak in this particular wine is perfect with the salmon that we're going to be enjoying yeah. with it, because that brings that kind of citrus note that's light and crisp, and it's a good counterpoint to the richness of the salmon. Absolutely. Now, we have someone asking, why are you drinking the wine first before you eat, during a tasting, before you sample the food? And if so, why? Why is that? The, the food is going to bring out different flavors. Certain foods with certain wines will bring out uh, either more severe flavors or different flavors, it will react with the wine a certain way. The, the main pairing that people always love to do and talk about is chocolate and red wine. If you sip red wine, then have a piece of chocolate, and then go back to the red wine, that wine will pucker your mouth out, almost like you're eating a lemon drop candy. It'll be interesting to see what the salmon does here. Absolutely. And just to point out, this Chardonnay is the Vin Hunter Chardonnay. It's, uh, Vin Hunter is our private label uh, wine program. Uh, we made this wine with our friends at the Alexander Valley Vineyards in Sonoma. Uh, we, we blend it to our specs. It offers a great value at $14.99. It's a reserve level wine. And uh, we're trying to make a wine that everyone will like. And hopefully uh, our panel will agree with that. And, uh, Pretty successful. Well. All right. Well, I'll let the two of you on the end taste, but Joe, hold off one second. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we have a question in here about, again, fish and Chardonnay or fish and white wine. That's, you know, a, a standard pairing there. Mm -hmm. But they're wondering if they could have red meat with a Chardonnay. Why or why not? Would that work? I just wrote a piece about the whole art of matching and pairing foods. I really believe that if you enjoy a flavor combination, something that you appreciate, then go ahead with it. The reason why certain foods are paired with certain wines is because there are chemical components, esters, aromas, flavor elements that match or count, contrast well with a certain thing. Like the Pinot, that will, or forgive me, the Syrah that we'll be trying. It's a spicy, it's a full-bodied wine, so you want something that's going to match that. That, pin, that uh, Syrah, forgive me, might well overwhelm this. So. Okay, some good advice there. We are getting a question from Lynn in the chat room right now. So, Joe, you can start eating. <laughs> but uh, I'll pose this to one of these guys. Um, Lynn is saying that she's finding the Chardonnay not overwhelmingly oaky, a good balance with a bit of crispness. Would you say that that's pretty accurate? Lynn, would you like a wine job behind us? Uh, that's Lynn a, that's can a have pretty a accurate description. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, great. So, that is, that's her take on it. And then. Um, there is another question in here about the difference between a $20 bottle of wine and a $200 bottle of wine. Can you guys honestly tell the difference? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to hope and think so. Yeah. Um, we can, I think we understand why a $20 bottle of wine would sell for $20, why a $200 bottle of wine would sell for $200. That's irrefutable. Uh, the price of land, the cost of goods, uh, the, the care in making the wine. Uh, but 
you know, you're, everyone's palate is, is, is unique. Uh, everyone's day is, this, is, is, is unique. How this, the wine might, uh, might be perceptible to your palate on a Monday might be different than it is on a Friday when you try that wine. So um, it's, it's really good to know the prices. Uh, don't get hung up on price. So price is a, a, a part of the equation. It is not the only singular factor of the choosing wine. Absolutely. I, I would say, I'll duck the question, but I'll say that, <laughs> that Ed is right. And I, earlier before the show, Ed and I were talking and I said, this is a great time to be a wine drinker because a $20 bottle now is, is, can be phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. I haven't had a lot of experience drinking $200 bottles, I have to tell you that. <laughs> All right. Um, let's wrap up any final thoughts on the Chardonnay. Anything that you did I'd like to talk say? about the pairing, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, and, please. Uh, I'll, I'll just, if I can just start. Sure. Um, I, I like the pairing a lot because, you know, salmon is a fattier fish. Mm -hmm. And again, it's all about now contrasting um, the, the Chardonnay with that crispness that we talked about, that acidity, that, that tartness. And acidity is not a bad word, so we'll talk about that later. But that acid of the Chardonnay is the backbone of the wine. It allows that fattiness of the fish to balance out the flavors there. I thought it worked out really well. All sure. right. Anything Very else, Joe? A really nice marriage. Good marriage of flavors. Excellent. Um, well, they agree with you in the chat room, so that's great. Um, we're going to move on to the rosé now. So as we kind of start that um, pouring, we have another question that I think is, is a really good question in the chat room. Um, this one is from Wine Gal, and she's asking, when a waiter opens a bottle of wine at a restaurant and presents you with the cork, what should you do with it? And Throw it, it back at them. Is it ever <laughs> acceptable? to say, nah, you know, once they've opened it, I don't want this wine. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. If you smell wet dog or wet cardboard, that wine is off because bacteria got into that cork. It happens, it doesn't mean the winemaker is an idiot, it doesn't mean that the process is totally screwed up. No, I mean, absolutely, if a wine, a, that wine will taste like vinegar, but the smell is, wet cardboard smell is so bad. And a good sommelier in a restaurant, a good wine steward will agree with me. All and, you know, right, uh, it's often dismissed, the, the whole cork thing. But if you squeeze that cork and roll it between your fingers, it should be nice and springy and firm. If it's crumbly, if it feels dry, then you've got a problem, or you've got the risk of a problem. Okay. The same thing then when you're going on to taste the wine in a restaurant. At, again, at that point, Mark, it's okay if you feel that this isn't what you had hoped oh, for. No. You can send that back. If you wouldn't want to do it often, but... No, but it, it has to be off. It has to be... It can't be, oh, I just I don't, don't like yeah, this. Yeah, well, that's exactly. tough. You ordered it and that's that. But if it's off, they'll, they should accept the fact. And I think, personally, it's always appropriate to ask, can I just get a very small pour, just a little taste of that? Oftentimes, they'll have a system such as this, or they have bottles in the back, and they can pour you a splash. And, Denise, we won't belabor this point, but there's, there's a lot of controversy about what percentage of wines do have tainted corks whether it's, it's anywhere between 2 and 3% to as much as allegedly 10%. Oh, wow. okay. I'm not sure it's quite that high, but you know, it could be. Okay. All right, well, at home, we are getting ready to try the rosé. So if you're pouring that at home, again, we want to hear what you have to say about the rosé. Um, Ed, tell us a little bit about this wine again, what, what you're looking for and, and sure. what it should taste like. And I'll let my, my two counterparts talk about rosé and, and how it's probably the most misunderstood uh, <coughs> wine uh, in the wine world. Uh, this is, again, from our friends at the Alexander Valley Vineyards, this is a rosé that's made out of Sangiovese. The average American doesn't know what Sangiovese is. The average American, however, knows what Chianti is. Sangiovese is the grape of Chianti, so it's fam it's, it's fa uh, the most famous wines of Italy come from this grape called Sangiovese. What they have with this wine, it's a state-produced uh, rosé. The Sangiovese grape is a red-skinned white fruit grape. So what they do to get this color is they leave the skins in contact with the, the white fruit for a very short period of time, and they make this the rosé color. So a little bit of the red, a little bit of the white, you get the rosé. That's the color. The flavors are less tannins, very effusively fruity. Um, this smells like summer in a glass to me. This is yeah. when you're watching it blizzard outside and it's 80 below zero. This is the kind of wine you look forward to drinking when it's summertime out because it really is refreshing. It's fun. It's engaging. It's it's all about summer. I took good. No, go ahead. I took one sniff and I'm smelling uh, black currants and I'm smelling some grapefruit. It's a wonderful flavor and the color. I don't know if you could pick this up at home. That color, if you, unless you poured your own, <laughs> is a beautiful. Just a lovely tawny pink, little touch of apricot shade. Really pretty wine. I you should, know, you, there ahead. was a, a term here, tannins, and someone had asked us in advance if this panel of experts could tell us what the heck tannins are, and I think a lot of us have a general idea, but go ahead and go through that well, a little it, bit. It's an organic compound found in 
in uh, bark and seeds and certain plants and uh, and also in the skin of grapes. And and Joe, what you were describing it earlier, how would you describe that when you're chewing on on the skin? What would that be? It's, it yields a certain bitterness. And There's a, a, an astringency. Um, it's hard to describe. The only way to put it, and it's not as extreme as if you tasted an aspirin and your mouth sort of draws together. Okay. It's a drying kind of aspect, which makes it perfect to go with a lot of richer meats. And in this case, the cheeses. That balances out that unctuous, real, rich, fatty kind of flavor. Let's talk about the pairings um, that we have here this evening here at Heinen's, again in Pepper Pike. Um, let's talk about what you selected for the pairing for a rosé. Okay, this is a, a great cheese from California. Uh, it, it's called Purple Haze. It's a goat cheese that has Again, the flavors of summer. There's some lavender in there, there's some fennel pollen. Um, goat cheese is a, uh, one of the most tart uh, cheeses. So again, we're, we're looking at contrasting of flavors and textures. So the tartness of the goat cheese with the ripeness of the fruit of the rosé. And, and just to address this, rosés can, the cheaper rosés are kind of sweet and not very complex. Mm -hmm. This has a bit of the requisite sweetness, but it's balanced, I, I hope you agree. There's some nice acidity there, again, so uh, that it doesn't just come off as sweet, it comes off as ripe and fruity right. and gregarious. You know, and I should add, Joe and I have not, purposely did not try any of these wines before right. this, so our reaction is really pretty much the same as someone at home who's just trying these for the first time. I would, Ed was very eloquent in how he described this wine. I would describe it in one word as dangerous. This wine is too smooth. It's like fermented fruit punch in a very good way. It is so inviting. And I think yep. this is a wine, if you want to bring this to um, as a gift for someone, if you go to a party and you've got dry wine drinkers and sweet wine drinkers, bring this. Yeah. This is a perfect marriage. <clears throat> My D word would be delicious. And I always avoid that word because, you know, it's, so, it's such a non-word. But one sip, one smell, it's just a delicious wine. You can get the aroma a foot away. It was yeah, amazing. absolutely. Amazing. And I think that now, uh, after having the cheese, I don't know if you had the goat cheese or not, but it almost tastes like there is a, a bunch of fresh raspberry puree that's put right on top of that goat mm. cheese. You know, it, it brings out and highlights those kind of ripe berry flavors that are kind of inherent in this wine already. Wow. Very nice. We, we do have another question asking about the glasses. They see that you're using glasses with stems. You know, some of the newer glasses are stemless. Does it matter in a wine tasting or, you know, the size of, of the glass or the width? Tell us a little bit about which glasses you should use or does it matter? <coughs> well, you guys chewing on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you use a stem glass because it keeps your hands off the wine and keeps it from war warming the wine through your hand. When you have a chilled wine such as this rosé, personally, I think a stemless glass, basically an old-fashioned glass or whatever, is perfectly acceptable. If you're just among friends, you're on the patio or at the table, particularly when you get into wines that are served in room temperature, like a red wine. I'd say, while the sh and I'll go back to the food pairings for just a second, while the Chardonnay went with the salmon, there wasn't a major change in the taste. This is a drastic change. We had a really fruit forward, uh, it just punched you with a lot of sweet, oh, not sweet, it's more fruity right. to mm -hmm. it, but it dries out because of that cheese. It, Absolutely. Was, it was amazing. Also, w regarding the glass, when you swirl, and this is especially true more with red wine than white, but when you swirl a bit and you can see what's these little streams, these little rivers coming down here, these are legs or tears, and they're, in, they're indicative of the alcohol content of the wine. It's just a little bit of trivia knowledge. You can impress somebody at a cocktail party. But the thinner and faster they are, the higher the alcohol content. And Mark just said a word that I just kind of tripped the trigger to me, uh, fruity. Fruity does not mean sweet. Right. Fruity right. means fruity. Uh, the, the, the wines are made out of grapes, which are, in fact, fruit. So uh, it's a sweet wine. Sweetness is sweetness, and I think that to say a fruity, you mean that it tastes like fruit. Yeah. It tastes like raspberries. It tastes like, uh, uh, we said black currants earlier, melon. Those are fruity <coughs> flavors, not sweet flavors. You can't taste sweetness. Sweetness is a perception on your palate. We're getting a question right now about the rosé. If it is sweet, if maybe not this one in particular, but if it is sweet, does that not make it pair well with the dessert, or does it pair well with, you know, does a rosé pair well with dessert? I think, again, to balance, sugar with sugar usually works out really, really well. So uh, a, a dry wine with something sweet will make the dry wine taste bitter. So you that's why dessert wines that are, uh, they're, they're frankly, make your teeth hurt kind of sweet. Uh, with the dessert, they're balanced out. They taste less, less sweet, a little bit drier because the sugar's balanced out. Appropriate. It's appropriate in that case. Sure. Yeah. 
Now this, we're asking this of a panel of, of all men, but someone is asking, um, can you speak you know, from your experience, is there a difference between the way women and men taste wine? Women are better, their palates and, are and better. And always right. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. Women are always right. That's and that's not the politically know. correct answer either. No, it's, it's, I don't know why. I'm not a doctor, no. but I've heard that and read that in it's countless accurate. places. Yep. Okay. What temperature should, um, Sharon is asking, what temperature should this rosé be? Did you say that's a, that? No, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, you want the wine to be cold, but not uh, freezing. Uh, the colder the wine, it'll dull the taste buds, it'll mute the wine's flavors, aromatics. Uh, you know, I usually say half an hour in the fridge, depending upon the ambient temperature of the room. Uh, that's why ice buckets seem to work out. Um, when we taste wine at, at our office professionally, a lot of times we'll try to taste wine at room temperature because when the wine is cold, it can hide some flaws. Right. So too cold is, is not too good. Okay, we are going to move on to the Syrah right now. Um, so again, post your questions, start pouring your that's Syrahs right. at home. Um, we're finishing up the, the rosé. Um, Keep that for later. And that was a hit. That was a real hit with everyone in the room, in the chat room, and also here with our panel. Um, while we're getting ready, Joe, let me Thank ask you, you this of course. question. Of course. Um, how do Ohio wines actually compare to California wines? What are some of the best Ohio wines out there? It's an excellent question. I think, and this is my personal rule of thumb, and I'm sure that hundreds of winemakers would disagree. I think that we tend to shine where it comes to our sweet wines, our ice wines. I don't know that we have, as a general rule, and I don't like to speak in general generalities, I don't know that we have quite the same finesse with um, fine red wines that tend to the dry side. All right. Mark, I, I'll put I would, you on the spot. No, I, w I would agree, and I would say uh, with climate change, certain regions, regions yeah. of this country are getting better for wine. And I've read several stories that say within our lifetime, within the next... 30 to 40 years, hopefully that's our lifetime, yeah, God will, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that Napa and Sonoma are going to be somewhat passe and Washington State and Oregon are going to be much better for wine. What's on the same latitude as that? Northeast Ohio, upstate New York. The wines in these regions are, getting, are doing nothing but getting better. I think the wineries here need to continue to have the courage to plant the right varietals for the region right. uh, and show that they can make things that are not just sweet because they can. There's Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Gewürztraminer, Riesling, they're, they're great wines. And uh, I think that done well and done right and done committedly, uh, Ohio wines, local wines, Grand River Valley wines, which is an AVA, can be as popular as the local beers are. Exactly. Years ago I lived in Florida and I did a story about the, the native grapes. And I take, took one taste and I said, this would be make a wonderful sparkling wine. Oh, no, 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 we're trying to go with a good dry table wine. And I said, you're 50 years away from that. As long as you keep that mentality, you're trying to shape okay. the wine to the grape at, as opposed to working with the flavors and characteristics. So absolutely, okay. absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about the Syrah, if everyone can just kind of, of get ready to taste that. Um, tell us what you're doing specifically with a red wine when you're you know, swirling and looking and things like that. Does Mark touch Mark? on earlier the color? <laughs> I think if the if the outer rim in here is is the same color as the as the wine, it's a younger wine. That's not good or bad. It just it is what it is. But if it's a little more brownish and this one is not, uh, then you're looking at an older wine, and, and it can almost look uh, it's almost like a reflective tan sure. color, and that indicates a little bit of age. And again, the legs and tears on this um, this one really narrow. I think this is probably around. Actually, I cheated. I looked. I just remembered. No, it's, I mean, this is around 13.5 to 14%, and that's kind of sort of typical. Um, it's got a wonderful aroma, and I'd love for people at home to try to gauge what that is because it's very unique, and I'm having a hard time coming up with it. Maybe current? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, sometimes as, as geeks, um, we, we know what Syrah should smell like. I think sometimes our supposition of the wine <coughs> blots out exactly what the wine is delivering. I always look for that, that bacon fat thing. Sometimes you see that as a, or the black pepper. Uh, and, and so sometimes it blinds me to actually what's going on in the glass. Because it's, I think there's some there, but I think there's something that's more superseding those, uh, those classic Syrah notes. And you know, the language that we're talking, the language that we're using here is very much personal impression. First time I sat into a professional wine tasting, it just blew me away because they're talking about chewing gum and erasers and right. rubber tennis shoes. And I'm seriously, you're real people, but it's what what resonates with you, what 
flavor that comes to mind for you? We have in the chat room someone saying that they find that this is this smells like chocolate to them. Yeah, that's sure. the oak, sure. Okay. Um, what are the best ways to shop for wine? And this would probably have to go to Ed. You know, when you're when you're uh, shopping. An open for wallet. Right? <laughs> open wallet. Yeah, yeah. At Heinz, yeah, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, someone is asking that they're saying that they only recently started drinking Syrah. What other types of wines? Um, maybe he hasn't heard of these before that he may be missing out on some of the more common wines that he could pick up at his local store. Wow. As in a different kind of varietal? Yeah. Uh, Zinfandel. Okay. Red Zinfandel, I think, is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a great value. It's not the Cabernet Merlot, Pinot Noir kind of a price point. I think it shares a lot of the same characteristics of ripeness of fruit, easy to understand, uh, great with the same kind of foods. I'm a big Zin fan. I like it too. This is almost like a Oh, I don't know, like a, a, a cousin to, to Zin in a way. It's mm -hmm. got similar characteristics. Syrah can be in two camps. It could be really overly fruity and jammy, or it could have a bunch of other different flavors, like a smokiness and, and maybe some pepper mm -hmm. and things like that. This is uh, this changed a little bit with the lamb. I think it dries out a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as much as the rosé <coughs> dried out after the, uh, after the dish, but uh, it's, it's very tasty. It's very nice. Yeah. It's delicious lamb, and I think it pairs well with this red. And there's a the pepper, actually, that kind of echoes some of those supposed Syrah flavors as well, and it kind of makes it pretty let's well. Let's talk a second about the pairing, because you guys are mentioning the lamb, but let's talk about it a little more specifically. Ed, do you, um, have, or <laughs> you just put some in his mouth, so I'm, I'll let no, you please, jump, please. Talk, uh, talk a little bit about this um, preparation you have in front of you. Uh, it's a simple lamb dish. It's a beautiful lamb, and this flavor is terrific. And it's the black pepper plays well off that pepperiness in this uh, red wine. This could easily go with um, a spicy preparation as well, the wine itself. Uh, I've had this once before with um, an Asian marinated pork that was slow roasted, and that was a nice pairing. Um, again, back to the questions that we're getting in now. Are there specific regions that are, are best known for Syrah in either um, California this grape or... This is all over the world. Yeah. Oh, it's, is it really? it's, a, okay. it's, uh, it's known as, correct me if I'm wrong, Shiraz in Australia, Syrah in virtually all other parts of the world, uh, and Shirazi in Iran, right, I think. Yeah, yeah. And but it's, it's, in France. It's, and it, but it's the same DNA of the grape. So it's, right. But it is all over. A lot of d different names of the same grape is because of the regions and, and the people in that area. Right. Someone That's is talking about a petite Syrah. Is that different? Is that different. different? different, what, different is, what are the differences? Uh, well, it's, it's actually it's, it's called petite Syrah. The, the, the technical name is called Durif, which everybody run out and buy your Durif. <laughs> uh, it's not labeled Durif. And it's labeled Petit Syrah for a lot of various reasons. Um, it's, a, it's, it's probably the darkest, inkiest red wine you can get. It will stain your teeth for a few days. Uh, it's big, strapping, uh, intense, uh, and it's very polarizing, I think, too. There are people that will just not like it at all. It's too big. It's too intense. It does demand certain kind of foods. Uh, it, it almost would make this taste like a white wine. But for those those palatable thrill, thrill seekers, I think it's a great wine. My wife describes Petit Syrah and a hearty cab as, as a wine you need a, a knife and a fork to, to drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what, what are your thoughts about this? What, do you, what are you enjoying most about the Syrah that you're tasting right now? It goes nicely from fruit to dry. We talked earlier mm -hmm. about you know, swirling, you know, feeling the... the the different flavors, and it, it, I think it starts one way and evolves a little bit in the glass. I'd like to see what this is like if we, you know, at a dinner party, wanted to open this ahead of time. Right. Taste right. a little bit first, just right out of the bottle to see how it, out of the glass, to see how it, how it is right away, and then see how the breathing time kind of opens it up. Exactly. Right. I'll play the geek balance card again. I think that the fattiness, that gaminess of the lamb right. mm -hmm. uh, worked out really well. That the, the Syrah is not overly tannic. Uh, I thought it went, went really, really well balance-wise and complementary flavors. Absolutely. The gaminess, of the, the gaminess of the meat, the richness of the meat, there's an austere quality mm -hmm. to this. It, they play well against each other. Right. Okay, we have just about a minute left. Why don't we talk about um, what we need to do, what people need to do at home if they want to do a wine tasting. From what we've done tonight, this seems like something simple that you could pull off, Absolutely. pick out some wines. If they came to you, Ed, and came into your store, would you be able to help them? Sure. Uh, all of our wine consultants and all of our stores would, would be joyously happy to plan these kind of things. They're fun to do. Uh, and dinner parties can start with wine. Wine is a communal beverage. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be talked about, as is great food. And um, to, to, to say, hey, we're having lamb. What's a good wine pairing with that? 
our wine consultants are happy to do that, and really it, it adds to uh, a great evening of friends, food, wine. It really is one of the perfect evenings you can create. We probably should have said that right up front, is that wine is very communal, and, and, it, and it is meant to be shared. All very right. Good. Very good. Any final thoughts, Joe? Any price point. You can spend a fortune, you can spend a pittance, and you can really have a fun time. All right, well, thank you so much. And that is all the time that we have tonight. Thank you so much for jumping in, and we, we hope that you tell us what you think. So what have we done right? What would you like to see next time? But we've had a blast doing this, and yeah. the time has just flown by. Thank you, Ed, Mark, Joe, and join us next time. Thank you. <laughs>